morning, good day, or indeed good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to another exciting Rock Jumper webinar, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Nikki Stewart with Keith Valentine, and we will be your moderators for today's talk. The Q&A box um, can be found at the bottom of your screen, and you're welcome to send us your questions during the webinar. A special shout out today to my husband. Happy 14th wedding anniversary, Gordon. I love you very much. <laughs> Keith and I count ourselves incredibly fortunate to work in the birding industry because birders, folks of all ages and bird watching skills are the most kind, curious, intelligent, and philosophical community to serve. Not your usual travelers, but naturally curious adventurers that above all believe in protecting biodiversity, a core value that drives all of us here at Rock Jumper Birding. So why do we love our feathered friends? What makes the hobby that so many of us are passionate about, so enjoyable? What is the lure of birding? And is it more than just the birds? Paul Varney joins us today to dive into the world of birding as a beginner. Paul lives in Norfolk in the UK and has been birding since the age of nine, more than 40 years ago. Birds and wildlife are his passion. And Paul has said how he feels really lucky as birding is a great hobby. Wherever you are in the world, all you need is a pair of bins and a notebook and you're happy. Welcome, Paul. Thank you for talking to us today. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Nikki. Thanks very much, Keith. Uh, so, yeah, really lucky to be able to talk to you today about um, bird watching and how, how do I begin bird watching? Well, as Nikki just said, it's it's a really genuinely fantastic hobby. Um, I feel really lucky to have a passion, a, a hobby that I'm really passionate about. And quite a lot of people, friends, family, really envy me having this kind of, uh, this, this absolute passion that I really enjoy doing. And I can do it anywhere in the world that I am. It's wherever I am, it's just one of these things that I can do very straightforwardly. And as Nikki said, I've been doing it for a long time now, since I was nine years old. Uh, we were kind of thinking about this um, this audience, Rock Jumper, and how do I begin birding? We weren't sure that this was the right audience. The Rock Jumper uh, crew or the Rock Jumper team is, is about birders that already know what they're doing. So we were thinking, we weren't sure whether beginning birding was a, was, a, was a good subject for you guys. But there were several people requested to have this and talk about how to begin birding and actually improve your skills and, and go about it from the start. So uh, for some people, there might be a few tips. For those of you that are experienced bird watchers and have done it for a long time, hopefully there'll be some points in there that you remember and think, oh, yeah, that's exactly what happened for me as well. So let's just dive in and, and, and enjoy kind of birds and how to give in, begin birding. So the great thing about birds is that they're everywhere. Wherever you go in the world, you can find birds. On every single continent, there are birds there. They're, they're, they're all over the place. Relatively speaking as well, they're much easier to see than lots of other forms of wildlife. For example, mammals, uh, much more hard to find. Birds are fairly obvious wherever you are in the world. Um, and also a great thing about birds is they, is they move. Obviously they can fly, most of them, uh, and they move. So we have this great thing with migration. You see the spectacle of migration. So you live in the north of Europe. In the winter, you get stuff coming down from even further north or this birds coming up from Africa or Southern Europe in the spring. So actually, wherever you are in the world, you can see things change over time through the year. So really lucky. I mean, just today, lunchtime, I went out for a quick walk just around the corner um, and there were some red wings and field fairs, spectacular thrushes that don't breed where I live, but come down from Scandinavia, from the northern parts of Europe for the winter and spend the winter around here. Uh, so great to see. In a month's time or two, they'll be gone and they'll be replaced by swallows from South Africa. So fantastic that you can see these things change through the seasons. So bird watching, 
the thing to remember about bird watching is just to relax just enjoy it it's, it shouldn't be stressful it should be just fun enjoy 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 birding is just great it shouldn't be stressful it should be just something that you do something that really brings you pleasure and that you enjoy having said that it does create lots of emotions for people uh, it can be relaxing it can be exhilarating it can be fun sometimes it can be devastating it can be disappointing when you go for a bird and you're trying to see something and it's not there or it's showing and your friend sees it and you don't that can be really disappointing and disheartening but on the whole bird watching is just really good fun and should create lots of emotion in people but there is one thing to remember that's really important for everybody it's addictive once you start and once you get hooked there's no going back it becomes something that you do every day all the time wherever you are driving a car to work you're looking out to see what birds you're seeing you should be watching the road but you can't help yourself uh, sitting in a work meeting sometimes you're looking out the window uh, and you're seeing what birds are around and you're trying to see what it is and you can't help yourself but identify things so it's addictive so uh, just bear that in mind but but on the whole it's really good fun so how do you get started well that's the great thing about birding it doesn't take a lot to get started in my opinion what you need is a, a pair of binoculars a notebook a field guide preferably a field guide for where you live or where you're going to go and loads of enthusiasm if you've got those four things then you're in good shape and for me the most important two aspects there apart from enthusiasm are your binoculars and your notebook nikki alluded to this right at the beginning these are the two key pieces of equipment for me that really make a difference for you and open up the whole world of birds and i'll just go into a bit of detail about why i think those two things are important but just also to add you can if you want buy a telescope and that can really enhance the whole birding experience bringing things closer to you and stuff but of course there's a downside you have to carry a, tri a, a tripod with a telescope on the top so that's something to bear in mind but if you have and you're interested and you want to kind of move on and buy a telescope you can get amazing views of things uh, by using a telescope so just to kind of why do we need optics what do the optics do well here's a kind of classic cliff faced seabird colony this is in arctic norway loads of uh, muirs or guillemots on the cliffs uh, sh uh, shag in the top left hand corner uh, and this is the view you get from the bottom when you're standing and looking up however when you've got your optics what you start to see is the detail and then you see that on the cliff there aren't just one type of muir or type of guillemot there are there are a couple there are on the left here the thick billed muir or the brunix guillemot and on the right hand side the common muir the common guillemot and you can start to see the subtle differences with your optics that allow you to identify the two different species the thicker bill of the uh, brunix guillemot the thick billed muir the, the white stripe on the bill the much blacker plumage compared to the common guillemot or the common muir on the right hand side some of which have this little white bridle around their eye so the optics the binoculars bring this into you and allow you to pick this detail out and allow you to see one really big question is what type of binoculars do i need uh, and this is a this is a classic thing for bird watchers to to kind of ponder over uh, endlessly have i got the right binoculars do i need different types can i get some new ones optics now the binoculars that you can buy are fantastic they've improved immensely and generally speaking when you're bird watching you want to be careful about the magnification the normal range that bird watchers would tend to use would be about seven times to ten times occasionally to 12 times but i would say in the range seven to ten most bird watchers are probably using eight times binoculars or ten times binoculars and that range is fine what you what you don't want is too big a magnification if you have too big a magnification it's very very difficult to hold your binoculars steady you'll start to see shape when you're looking through them um, so what you want is that kind of like that nice range that gives you a good view but doesn't uh, actually kind of cause you too many problems of holding them still if you're in areas where you're looking at kind of um, open uh, habitats savannas or prairies or uh, estuaries and things like that you might want to go for the higher magnification end the 10 times um, 
because actually what you're doing is scanning and looking for things that are often quite distant. Whereas if you're in an area of parkland or forest, uh, particularly rainforest, then often the smaller magnification types are much easier for finding things in forest. Uh, so those are two things to, to, uh, to kind of bear in mind when you're choosing your binoculars. There's a huge range in terms of price bands and quality and optics and, and different brands that are available. And binoculars are a really personal choice, I find. Um, so the best advice I could always give you is, is to go and actually go. <laughs> Unfortunately, at the moment, this is a challenging moment for us to try and go somewhere to try things. But when you can, if you're choosing binoculars, my best advice would be to go to somewhere where you can try a range of different pairs of binoculars, different types. And it's really about feel. Uh, you saw my binoculars in the previous photograph. I've got some Zeiss. I knew when I was going to buy them that I was going to buy a different pair. But I came out with that pair because they felt much better for me. They just they were the ones that... Uh, I gelled with, they felt nice in my hand. I found the magnification perfect for me. They, they, the focus was nice. So it's a very personal choice about which binoculars are the right ones for you and how heavy they are is a really key factor in that. So if you can afford them, go and get some binoculars. There's a whole range of prices available that could suit most budgets, uh, but your binoculars are your best friend and actually really enhance your whole kind of experience of bird watching. Second point was a notebook. Now, uh, why a notebook? Um, I'm a real fan of notebooks and there are lots of ways of recording things that you see these days electronically. You've got eBird and you've got iGoTerra. There's lots of different um, uh, softwares that you can buy that rec record your sightings. And they all have brilliant places because they can also be shared with researchers and organisations. So they're really good and valuable. But I'm a real advocate of having my own notebook. And, and why do I do that? Well, I find that with a notebook, uh, it's unsurprising you can you can make notes. So here's a copy of uh, a couple of pages in the notebook from a way back. It was one of my first trips to Brazil. It was for a kind of work related trip, completely un not to do birding. Uh, and um, I had no field guide at that time for the birds of Brazil. So I was seeing loads of things. I had no idea what they were. And the notebook allowed me to just write some short descriptions about what I was seeing, some really kind of rough little sketches to just kind of capture what I was seeing in front of me. And that allowed me later on to go back and identify the species that were actually on show in, in front of me. And on these two pages, with hindsight and going back over my notes and then checking out things later on, and of course more experience now, I've got eight new birds on these two pages just by kind of making some notes. So I'd really encourage you to kind of um, capture some notes in a notebook, uh, some short descriptions. I think the other thing about writing a, a description or particularly doing a little drawing is it really makes you look at the bird that you're actually, uh, that you have in front of you. So it's a really good way of kind of trying to put the structure of the bird together where the bits of pattern are. If you're trying to draw a picture and it's got a black patch on the back of its neck, then you, then you draw it on the back of its neck. So it helps you to actually see what's really there rather than kind of think about what was really there afterwards. Besides that, keeping a notebook's just really good fun. Uh, and I've got a whole load of notebooks. I, I tend to do it a bit excessively. I've got small ones, I've got big ones. Uh, and sometimes you just draw some pictures in them and, and you can reminisce and going back over your old notebooks is really good fun. I think when you're, um, when you're looking back at your old notebooks, about the birds that you saw on a particular day. You also remember the things that happened on that day. A whole load of memories will come flooding back just because you've made some notes, drawn a picture. Uh, it kind of triggers lots of other memories that have happened in that, uh, in that time. Now, some people are unbelievable. Some notebooks that you see in, uh, in the world are fantastic. There are artists and there are special notebooks that are just incredible. In 2018, we were really lucky in the UK. We had a, a beluga, a white whale uh, that was in the River Thames. Normally these are right up in the high Arctic. So to have one of these in the UK was really unusual and it was right near London. So it was uh, actually on the River Thames, not far from London city centre. Uh, and it was seen by loads of people, made national headlines. And one guy, and I, I, I'm really sorry, I, I couldn't find out the artist, um, but he did a drawing and he put it onto the internet and I think you'll agree that it's absolutely stunning. In, 
it's it's captured the beluga that we all saw in in such detail and it actually prompted um a lot of people on the internet to to ask him whether he did this from life was it a life sketch or did he draw it from photographs afterwards because the detail that he captured was just so amazing uh, and just to confirm that here's a photograph of the beluga uh, and you can see that he did actually capture it in all its glory but seriously there are some notebooks uh, that are incredible and and here's another one that i found on the internet uh, that chris orgill's last share uh, and i think that anybody would agree that this this is art this is a work of art um but it's but it's a birder's notebook um watercolor pictures of birds that he saw in norfolk last autumn fantastic images fantastic text uh, and actually um anybody would be amazed uh, to have this on the wall let alone as part of your collection of your birding memories so a notebook can be whatever you want it to be but but i would really encourage you as you start bird watching to start keeping a notebook of the things that you see uh write descriptions even do some drawings and try it doesn't matter if the drawings are great to start with as you practice more it will become better and better and you'll you'll it will really help you with actually identifying birds and understanding uh, what you're seeing so notebook other thing that you need is a field guide now field guides birders love a field guide uh, i mean th th there's no birder that i know that doesn't just enjoy the the, the new field guide coming out and the new field guides uh, that we're seeing these days are unbelievable they are fantastic the birds of argentina that's just been published by mark pierman there at the bottom right hand corner i think we've been waiting 30 years for this uh, for this document to come out this book to come out and it's as good as we all hoped it would be it's fantastic um within these books there is so much information uh they've got obviously the image of the birds but they have maps of where they occur they have descriptions of the voices and for bird watchers these are basically uh travel brochures um when, when you get a new field guide like birds of new guinea or birds of east africa you start to plan your trip by what you want to see where you're going what birds might i encounter so your field guide is is really your kind of reference point for wherever you are in the world and most places now you can get a really decent field guide to cover the area that you live in or that you're traveling to so i would really encourage you to to have a look at those of course when you dive into them what you've got is is information it's it's exactly what it says it's a field guide it's it's a guide to how to identify the species that you might see so here from the sibley the north american guide uh, you can see that you've got a whole range of fantastic paintings that show the birds in their different plumages because one of the challenges of birds is that they aren't they don't all look the same for each species the male looks different from the female which looks different from the immatures or they may even change uh, plumage during the different seasons but here in the book you've got the kind of key features fantastic images fantastic drawings but also often some notes about what to look for for example on the black burning warbler you can see that it checks out the pale braces on the back being unique amongst the wood warblers of, of north america so there's a feature immediately that if you're looking for wood warblers you start to know what to look for so it helps you to kind of identify the species that you're seeing i would encourage you to just dive into the to the to the field guides F flip through them just look through them you'll be amazed and surprised how much information you actually kind of take on board by just looking uh through the field guides it's it's just a i mean it's not a bad thing to do anyway because it's just such good fun looking through all the different species that you might see in an area but as you're doing it you're learning you might not even know that you're learning but you really are kind of picking up information so yeah dive in and, and understand and, and, and explore the birds of the area that you're going to. New guides have got some new features. Um, they often have things like I've said to you about kind of uh, vocal or, or word descriptions of, of the calls of species of birds. This is quite tricky sometimes and you can see in this new guide, the, the New Guinea guide that's just come out, they've got these QR codes. This is a nice new innovation that there's now happening and that means with your phone you can now click over the qr code and you go to a link on a page where you can see pictures you can see video you can hear voice recordings so it adds a whole load more kind of quality information that you can uh, you can uh, ascertain from the field guide itself 
And the other part of this is the maps. Uh, you can see on the right hand side with the images, you've also got maps of distribution. Again, really important um, when you're going to places to understand the most likely species that you're likely to see in one area. And then you can start to fine tune what is it that I need to understand about the species in this patch and what, what are the differences are. So field guides, fantastic. Bird watchers love a field guide. Dive in, enjoy and learn as you go through. Again, just like the birds, once you, once you start buying your bird books, um, I'm afraid this is also addictive and you start to become a bit of a hoarder of books. Uh, but I can't think of anything nicer than sometimes on a dark evening, flicking through and traveling to another part of the world by picking up one of these books and just diving in and uh, thinking about the birds of Japan or the birds of Africa. It's just great fun. So uh, be careful with that because you'll need a bigger house. Uh, but bird books, great. So you've got your binoculars, you've got your optics, you've got a notebook, you've got a field guide, time to go out and do some birding. So this is what we want to do next. So we've already talked about birds being anywhere and everywhere. So where can I go birding? Well, that's the great thing about birding. You can literally go anywhere. Uh, start local in your garden, parks, lakes, the coast. If you happen to be living on the coast, that's fantastic. That's a real bonus. But just dive in and explore the birds that live locally around you. Just enjoy them and see. And you will start to learn what, what's common locally, what birds you see regularly. Um, and actually, you'll also start to learn how they, how they kind of uh, how they behave, what they look like in terms of patterns and so on and so forth. And then you become more familiar with the local birds. If you join a local club or society, there's an opportunity for learning from someone else that's been doing it for longer. Uh, and you would expect Rock Jumper to say that guides are good, but actually a guide can be in your local bird club, someone that's been bird watching for a while, go out with them, walk with them, watch where, how, they, how they do it, watch the things that they pick up on. They'll talk to you about how they identify species, what a species sounds like, all these features that are really, really helpful. So I would really encourage you to do that. It's a, it's a worthwhile thing to do. And there's lots of expertise. And as Nikki said right at the beginning, bird watchers on the whole are a really nice group of people and really willing to share and, and help people to learn. So most bird watchers that I've met have been really willing to help people kind of learn and and pick up on their bird identification skills. Often in the field guides, you'll see that um, there are kind of sections on habitat as well. Sometimes there are, uh, are bits of information. This is from uh, the uh, Birds of Brazil, the uh, Wildlife Conservation Society books. Um, and you can see that they have different sections on secondary forest or farms or lowland forest. And they talk about the species that occur there. And that's the great thing about birds, that they also, as well as occurring everywhere, different species are found in different habitats. So as you become more familiar with what you've got locally, you can start to say, well, I'm gonna go and try somewhere else now. I'm gonna go and look at a different habitat uh, and then you'll find different species. Now, it's really important to understand that different species uh, are easier to find in certain habitats than, than others. So for example, if you're on estuaries or prairies or, uh, or kind of open marshlands or savannas, uh, you'll have lots of birds that are probably perhaps larger and kind of scattered around and you're scanning for them. So relatively easy to find by scanning and looking. If you're in woodland and forest, much harder to perhaps see the species to start with. You need to, you need to use different techniques, use your ears and things like this. Uh, but we'll come on to a bit of that in a little while in terms of that, some, some craft that you can use. Um, so it's more reliant on your on your hearing and, and actually listening for birds uh, that, that's going to help you in, um, in in the kind of foresty areas. If you're in tropical regions as well, that the band around the middle of the earth tends to have more species uh, per area than, than if you go north or south. But often north or south, you might find big colonies, for example, seabird colonies or or, or whatever growing uh, 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 have inhabited the areas, but perhaps less diversity but bigger congregations of species. But in terms of species diversity, the, the tropics and, the, and particularly the forests around the tropics are the really rich areas where there's huge number of species in relatively small areas. But again, that's the whole value of, um, of, of birding in different places. They, they bring different things for you. So tips for finding birds. Well, uh, 
walk slowly and quietly. I mean, it sounds really obvious, but if you walk slowly, you'll you'll see things, uh, you'll you'll hear things, you'll pick up movement, and obviously, quietly means that you're not flushing things off the off the track or from the trees. So walk slowly, walk quietly. Stop and frequently scan. Um, occasionally, you might find a nice little glade with a, a bit of sunshine sort of shining on some bushes or trees. Lots of insects. Wait for a few minutes. See what comes down. See if there's some activity. Birds will come often to kind of nice sheltered spots or where there's water. So, so stop frequently and scan. And that goes for any type of habitat you're in. You know, just have a look with your binoculars and see what you can find and then you'll see things. As we've said, listen for sounds. Um, sounds are really helpful in terms of not only finding species, but then also identifying species. Some birds are it's much easier to actually identify by the, the noises that they make or they're even easy, they're, you can only find them by hearing them first. They're so skulking sometimes. Uh, so sounds are really important. And that's, an, that's one of the sort of skills that kind of comes over time as you, as you become more familiar with the species locally. Sometimes you're actually not looking for the bird itself. You're actually looking for the movement, particularly in forest. You see a leaf movement or you'll see a, a, a branch bounce as a bird's moved off it. So watch for movement in particularly in forest areas or in reed, uh, reed beds, things like this, because that's the in indication that something's around and moving in there. And kind of not surprisingly, avoid bright colours. You're trying to blend in. Uh, you can see in the picture that birders have a kind of a, a fairly kind of uh, similar uniform quite often of khakis and greens and beiges. Uh, so um, that's often to blend in and to try and not be too obvious in terms of uh, looking like you're standing out in the forest with a nice orange jacket. Um, and avoid noisy clothing. As you're walking, you know, if your clothing's noisy, then you're going to, even if you're trying to walk slowly and quietly, if, you're, if your clothes are making lots of noise as they, as they uh, rub or move, uh, then, then that's going to flush things as well. So some tips for finding birds. So we've already talked about where you can find them. The garden. The first place that you can start is the garden or the local park. And often uh, in these places we have feeders. So garden bird feeders are a fantastic place to start birding. Um, you can see a whole range of regular species come down. But the great thing about bird feeders is you, it, get, it allows you to see things quite frequently, but also allows you often really good views. So it really allows you to study birds and become familiar with them. They're often really confiding. They often come back regularly. So it does mean that you, you start to become familiar with the species that are regular in that area. There's two pictures here, a, a robin from the UK and a, a white-throated sparrow from the US. Both garden bird feeders um, would readily come into gardens, readily come into parks. Uh, and as I said, they're a really good place to start. If you do any tours or you travel abroad, abroad, lots of places have bird feeders and some of the bird feeders are amazing. Uh, here's a, a really busy bird feeder in uh, Asa Wright in Trinidad. Every morning, this was an absolute pleasure to stand up on the balcony and watch. There's thousands of hundreds of banana quits and honey creepers and oropendulas and toucans would come in and feed underneath, there'd be agoutis, these little mammals uh, that would come in and feed on the, on the scraps. But a whole range of activity, notwithstanding the fact that just in front of you on the feeders, there are hummingbird feeders just in front of your eyes as well, attracting loads of hummingbirds. And unfortunately, I heard just this week, I read that uh, Asa Wright is actually closing, which is a, a direct result of the pandemic and not being able to continue. The forest is protected, but I believe that the uh, the actual location is, is closing, which is a real shame because it was one of the real pleasures of, of birding to stand on that balcony and just watch all the all the activity of the bird feeders every morning. So some bird feeders are busy. Some bird feeders are just amazing. Uh, Golden Tanager on Equ in Ecuador uh, also feeding on these same feeders were things like glistening green Tanager, flame faced Tanager. Uh, just behind you would be Empress Brilliant Hummingbirds and Velvet Purple Coronet Hummingbirds. Fantastic place to, to watch birds and some of them absolutely stunning. And unlike the UK uh, and uh, Northern European um, bird feeders where we don't tend to put out many bananas, bananas and melons are the, are the order of the day in the tropics where, where a lot of the, bird, uh, the birds enjoy kind of uh, sweet things and, and sugar and nectar. So yeah, Golden Tanager, well worth a look. 
some of them are exhilarating some feeders uh, so here's a photograph of my wife holding a hummingbird feeder again in ecuador and uh, hummingbirds just come and readily perch on your hands just to sip the nectar from the bowl uh, and two species of hummingbird here a fawn breasted brilliant on the front left hand side and some buff tailed coronets the three at the back uh, fantastic and it's only when you get this close these are actually quite big hummingbirds that you realize how tiny birds are uh, and that's one of the things i would say to you about field guides going back to them when you're looking at the images of birds in field guides one of the really difficult things is to gauge size of what you expect to see i remember the first time i saw an avocet a pied avocet i expected it to be a heron type size bird it was a and they're, they're tiny they're they're only you know uh, 20 centimeters tall uh, so they're very small relative to what the picture looks like because they look like they've got long legs in the field guys it looks like they're going to be a big bird but in fact they're very small so be careful of that and take note of the sizes that the, the field guys often put in there as well so some of them are exhilarating uh, fantastic species seeing some andy and hummingbirds some of them are absolutely breathtaking now i can't claim uh, credit for the next photo but in northern australia in queensland um, they even have uh, southern cassowaries come to the feeders uh, now these are huge birds standing about almost 1.7 meters uh, from the ground so a really a really significant size bird um, quite formidable can be quite dangerous if you get uh, if you get in in a, in a situation where you've got an aggressive one um, but what a fantastic thing to have coming into your feeders and that's the thing about feeders wherever up you are in the world you put some food out birds will find it birds will come and that will allow you some fantastic views some fantastic opportunities to study uh, what's coming locally and if it's of course a new place a fantastic opportunity to see a whole load of new species that you've not seen before so yeah bird feeders are a great place to start really important to not be intimidated by birding it's just it's, it's, it's really really just about having fun and enjoying them identifying them is really important i get that and, and we all want to know what we're seeing but for me watching them is even more important watching and enjoying um you know if i see a a, a great tit or a blue tit in the garden on a feeder when you actually look at them with your binoculars and and it, uh really kind of study the kind of plumage colors and the and the different patterns it's it's fantastic just to watch how they how they move and and how the colors change in the different lights so watching them is really really important enjoy the plumage the shapes the activity what they're doing get to know what's regular and this is a little personal tip um, and there are loads of photographers probably on the call as well and uh, lots of my colleagues are really great at photography but i found particularly when i was starting bird watching and starting photography that i would often try and get a photograph of the bird and then when i when it's gone i would realize that i actually never looked at it properly so i would really encourage you to to actually think about watching the birds first and think about the photograph second so if it's still there after you've had a good look at it then take the photograph i know it's not always the case because sometimes you see something and you just need to get that photo but it's just a tip that you know it can stop you actually looking at the bird and really enjoying it so um yeah make, make the most of seeing the birds in the first place so important that we now talk about identifying your birds so birds generally speaking are um there aren't a huge number of them there are enough there are about 10,000 species or 11,000 species just under by depending on which list you look at um, and uh, some of them are similar and there's a huge range of diversity so identifying your birds is really important some groups are really tricky for example the snipes uh, here's a photograph of a puna snipe that Rob took in uh, in the Andes common snipe swinnow snipe pintail snipe of course i'm joking it's all the same bird but i'm just making a point snipes all look very very similar uh, they do look very similar so so just be aware that birds can be really tricky to identify they are quite difficult some groups but other groups are not so bad um if you i would say just don't be daunted uh, just accept that some groups are tricky and for all those guys in north america where you have these fantastic bright colored wood warblers 
Uh, this is a plate from the Collins Bird Guide for Birds of Europe. And these are our warblers. Uh, so these are the Acrocephalus warblers that we get in Europe. And, and you can see that these are all pretty similar. Four species on this page, very, very similar. Um, and often you're looking at very subtle differences in shape, uh, plumage tones, shape of eye stripe. Um, but often uh, some of these species would be best identified by voice or habitat. So um, just be, be comfortable that you won't identify everything that you see. That's always tricky to identify every single bird you see. You might want to, but just accept that you, you won't. Even the best birders in the world don't identify every single species that they see. But as you practice, as you become more familiar with the things that you're seeing on a regular basis, you create baselines that you can then start to work from. And that allows you to see the things that are different from what you'd normally see. So the more you do it, it's the same with anything. The more you practice, the better you get. So get out there and do some birding and you'll start to learn things as you, as you go. Now, often in the field guide, you'll find this little map at the front. Most, I think nearly every field guide that I've ever seen has these little maps of the, of the birds in the front. And what they're trying to do here is to flag the important parts of the birds to be able to identify the different species. So the little, we call them field marks. What are the main feather tracks? So what are the main kind of bunches of feathers that the bird has? And particularly on the wings, this is really important. The greater coverts, the lesser coverts, the median coverts, but also things about um, superciliums and crown stripes and rump patches. Field guides have these in for a reason. These are really good features that help you separate different species. So when you're looking at a bird, these are the types of things that you need to be taking notice of. Do they have a wing bar? Do they have a crown stripe? These things. So what we're going to do now is just have a look at a, a, few, a few different kind of field marks on some birds and see, see what they've got. So here's a fantastic pine grosbeak. Um, apart from being raspberry red, what the pine grosbeak shows is some nice wing bars. It's got not one, but two two big white wing bars. So these are features that are really helpful for some species of warbler. Um, often finches or buntings have different types of, uh, of, of wing bars. So that's a feature that you're often looking for, for on the different groups of species to, to be able to separate different types. So have they got wing bars? What about head markings? Uh, a supercilium is a good word. So the supercilium is this big white stripe above the above the eye on this white browed robin chat that Clayton took in uh, in an African country, I presume down in South Africa somewhere. Um, huge white stripe. Um, bird watchers love a big supercilium, I've got to tell you that. Um, any bird with a good supercilium we all like. And this is a good supercilium, a nice big white stripe above the eye, uh, flaring at the back. You can see the juvenile on the left hand side. You've got a hint of it with this kind of just buffy line above the eye. So that would have a kind of subdued supercilium, but supercilium is a really good feature and often separates species. Sometimes species can have a split supercilium uh, where it's two toned. It's like buff in front of the eye and paler behind, or it can be even split into two lines. So the shape and the size and, and the color of a supercilium is a really good feature. Field marks also rumps. Uh, colour the rump. Uh, often birds flying away, sometimes you'll see a rump colour. Uh, this is a Wilson storm petrel, a nice big white rump there, look at that. Uh, no mistake in that. And for petrels, um, rump colour can be quite important. Some birds, some petrels have all dark rumps, completely black. Uh, some have a kind of a dark stripe down the middle, white around the sides. Sometimes the white rump actually wraps around underneath the tail. So these are features that are really important but lots of different types of birds have a rump patch. So it's a really good feature. Often it's the thing that you'll see as a bird flies away. So again, a rump patch is a really good thing to look for. And you can also see on this bird, you could say that it's got pale coverts. On the top of the wing, you've got some pale edges to the coverts. So not quite a wing bar, but almost a wing bar. Now some birds, uh, they just take it to an extreme. So where do you start? So here's a Wilson's Bird of Paradise uh, from the West Papuan Islands. Um, and you could say, well, it's got a blue crown. Um, but actually, you know, where do you start in terms of field marks? It's got it's got hundreds of field marks. And sometimes you don't need to worry about the field marks. Just just enjoy. 
a bird lot often these types of birds are fairly easy to identify pretty straightforward lots of features uh, and actually just just need looking at and enjoying so um, make the most of them drink them in and, and and absolutely enjoy and i'm hoping one of these days i'm going to get out there to see one of these uh, on, a, on a tour uh, hopefully next next uh, or hopefully this year even fingers crossed with the uh, with the covid situation and also beaks legs eyes all differ on different species of bird they all have different uh, shapes depending on the food that they're eating uh, their the leg length is different um, the colors of the bill the colors of the eye uh, these are all parts of the jigsaw puzzle coupled back to the field guide that allow you to separate different species and identify different species when you come across them and if you just look at this group of, pe uh, of birds that are on the on the page at the moment that's the great thing about birds the huge diversity of, of types and species and colors uh, that's what makes them so fascinating so much variation is what makes it such a great place uh, to start and have a hobby they are just fantastic and uh, and so varied and, and and in different parts of the world you just see different things so it just really encourages you to get out as well as all that things to note like where is it is it on the ground is it in a canopy birds will differ in terms of the habitat that they uh, that they they like to in, uh, feed in uh, there are particularly if you're going to rainforest there are different species that occur in different strata uh, of the canopy from the very bottom on the floor right through the to the upper canopy how does it move is it creeping around is it shuffling does it hop does it flip some birds even dance they kind of sit there and waggle their their belly and stuff like this is it wagging its tail does it flick its wings these are all things that help in the identification of a species and often captured in a field guide these will be clear um, uh, features that they they describe in the field guide that help sometimes separate species there are certain species of warbler in europe uh, that dip their tail and there are others that that uh, sort of move their tail around in a circle and those two features are helping actually identify the species of two similar, similar looking species does it call or sing? Voice can be a really good way to identify and find some birds. So not only finding them, but then identifying them. And if anybody on the on the call now has been on a on a rock jumper tour, you will know absolutely how much the, the guides rely on their hearing. They're, they're constantly listening for species. Uh, sometimes they're using maybe playback to call birds out, but often it's actually detecting birds. Uh, and actually the un understanding what species is making the call that actually allows you to find the, the birds that are really special, the ones that are a little bit uh, rarer or, or a, a bit more skulking. So voice can be really a good way to identify birds, but also to find them. And actually, there are kind of fantastic resources on the internet, like Xena Canto is a fantastic resource. Um, bird watchers just loading up bird calls that they've recorded in different countries around the world They've now got 10,000 species on the site that you can go and listen to and you can download um, a fantastic resource uh, for bird watchers that uh, sharing with other bird watchers. And, and I would really encourage you to go and have a listen, perhaps firstly for the birds that are in your area. But certainly if you're going to a new place, uh, that's a great way of kind of understanding um, what those words that they put in the field guide actually sound like when you listen to the bird calling and singing. So you're all set uh, you kind of you've got your bins you've got your notebook you kind of understand what's locally around uh, it's time to spread your wings and to explore further afield now you can do that locally you know you can travel further afield in your own country travel to different habitats different regions within your country or you can travel internationally and of course rock jumper we have loads of different trips where we can make that happen with you and actually show you the species with, with expert guides actually in the field that can show you the species and help you see as many species as you can on the on a short trip the great thing about that is that not only are you now birding you're now starting to see some amazing places around the world you could be finding yourself birding around an iguazu falls in the atlantic forest of brazil or in brazil and argentina it actually straddles the two um, fantastic range of hummingbirds, tanagers, ant birds, ant pitters. Uh, you could perhaps combine it with a trip to the Pantanal or the Amazon. 
uh, a fantastic trip and Iguazu Falls is one of those places that if you ever get a chance you, you have to go and see it. it's incredible this is this is just a fraction of the falls or you might find yourself burning in the cloud forests of either Ecuador or Colombia uh, possibly the the most diverse birding area on the planet um, in terms of number of species per area just an amazing range of fantastic looking birds um, some that are really obvious and easy to see like the hummingbirds and the tanagers some that are really tricky like um, ant pitters uh, tapaculos uh, but absolutely unbelievable birding in fantastic scenery and in, um, in cloud forests in there in there in ecuador colombia and, and the andes or you might find yourself in the west papuan islands in a place as scenic as raja ampert um, cruising the islands, looking at different species, scenically beautiful, orn ornithologically really diverse, birds of paradise, um, monarchs, loads of fruit doves and pigeons, parrots, fantastic scenery, fantastic birding uh, in a really relaxing and amazing setting. Or the iconic savannas of uh, Africa, East Africa, Tanzania. I think we all, even if we haven't been to Africa, uh, Kind of recognize scenes like this with the herd of elephants in a river uh, river valley with this kind of iconic vista of um of, uh, of the kind of the kind of natural habitat interspersed with loads of trees lots of birds in this habitat lots of raptors lots of um, uh, mouse birds and other things like that uh, birds big game and incredible vistas or further south in africa down onto the south african coast uh, you can combine this kind of unique, unique habitat with different species to East Africa with perhaps some incredible big game down there, but also a trip out into the Southern Oceans to see not only some of the seabirds, the albatrosses, the, the petrels, the, uh, the, the Terodroma petrels, which uh, bird watchers love, and also maybe the chance of things like Southern right whale and, and dolphins and other whales. So again, another fantastic place to visit with a whole range of different species that you haven't uh, encountered elsewhere. And then of course, perhaps the most uh, iconic place in the, on the planet, the wildest place of all Antarctica, where now it's quite easy to, to visit in terms of a tour, an organized tour, incredible scenery, probably not so much of a diverse uh, species list, but huge numbers, huge spectacles, um, and, and clearly a once in a lifetime, or certainly a once in a lifetime and certainly on my bucket list uh, trip uh, to go to, but, but fantastic opportunity to go and see these places. Now, if this has kind of whet your appetite, uh, Rock Jumper does a, does a kind of a, a, a program called the Seven Continents Program. Now, what this is, is a, a program where you, where you sign up and you kind of visit one of these continent, one continent a year for seven years and every continent that you visit over that seven year period, you get a discount culminating in a whopping 17 and a half percent discount on your last trip. Now, if your last trip happened to be Antarctica, uh, that's a big saving, but you've also seen a fantastic array of, uh, of places, of habitats and of course, amazing birds and wildlife. So I would really encourage you to have a look on the website and see if there's anything in there that's interesting for you because some fantastic places to visit and, and, and Rock Jumper, we can make it happen for you. So it's absolutely unquestionable that, that with birding, you get to go to the most beautiful places on earth. There's no question about that. The most beautiful places you can possibly ever visit. Not always the case, to be fair. And uh, here's some photographs from uh, Northeast India, Assam, uh, of some great adjutants, which are, uh, are now classified as endangered. Uh, but they love a good rubbish tip. Uh, so this is one of the places where people go to see these birds. Um, uh, really kind of similar to the marabou that you get in uh, in Africa. Uh, a fantastic looking huge stalk. Um, and unfortunately not on the most um, salubrious of kind of scenic vistas. Um, and I was reading just the other day that, um, that adjutant is a, it's a military term. And apparently these birds were named... Uh, after the military because of their stiff movements the way that they move is very slow and deliberate and and stiff and it, it reminded people of of, uh, of soldiers or or the military guys so hence adjutants um but yeah fantastic looking bird in not such a fantastic looking setting as well as birds as well as scenery 
uh, you also get to to uh, experience incredible culture as you travel around the world and see these things um, and meeting people from different cultures uh, experiencing the way that people live in different parts of the world is also part of the whole um, it's, it's part of the whole experience of being a bird watcher and, and and you get to go to places that often people would never experience or or even dream of going to so in Ethiopia the Mercy women uh, you might end up in Kenya and experience uh, some of the Maasai culture uh, or on a trip to Ethiopia you might see how the the Hama girls in the Oma Valley are living uh, and all these things are amazing to see in terms of the way that different people on the planet are, are kind of existing alongside wildlife. You're in fantastic habitats, but you're also seeing how the indigenous people are living um, and, uh, and sharing their lives with nature. Sometimes you might meet the mud men of uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, and if you, if you get to, to, to meet these guys, you might become friends with them. But uh, we have also uh, examples of our rock jumper guides becoming good friends with uh, the Hooti wigmen. Uh, wig men. So, um, you meet some real kind of interesting characters as you travel around the world. And I find that um, when you're interested in wildlife and birds, often the people that you meet are also really fascinated with your hobby and they recognize that you're interested in, in, in wildlife and they'd like to uh, share that with you. So you get to meet some fantastic people uh, and enjoy a really good time. As well as that, of course, you've got real cultural highlights. You know, if you're in India and you're doing a tour in India, uh, you're going to have to go and look at the Taj Mahal, you know, this iconic building, uh, fantastic place that, that would be right in the middle of one of our India tours. Or you might find yourself in just something that you've never, you'll never forget, a breathtaking experience, something that will just take your breath away as you kind of uh, wing your way across the, the Serengeti, perhaps, or some savannas in Africa on a hot air balloon experience. So some experiences that you get from doing bird tours can, can be really fascinating. So birding, it can be relaxing, it can be a solitary pastime. I think in recent weeks and months, because of all the kind of coronavirus issues around the world, uh, to have bird watching as a hobby uh, has been really fantastic. You can, you, can, you can go out for a walk, take your binoculars, and suddenly you have an extra dimension to your, your, your daily exercise. Uh, as I said earlier on, seeing the, the, the winter thrushes just down the road from me. Um, you can do it in groups. Uh, here's a group of us uh, looking for a blue crown hanging parrot in the trees up here, all enjoying each other's company. One of the guys found it in the group. We all, we all get to share it. We all get to experience it together. Uh, and it sometimes intrigues others. This guy on the bike here was an 18 year old uh, lad that had cycled from the UK. He was cycling all the way to Australia. Um, quite impressive at the age of 18. Um, he met us a couple of times, actually. And this time we were looking at this blue crown hanging parrot. He was he was really excited. So he got his camera out, he was taking photographs. I'm sure he would have been uh, sending photographs to his mum and dad later that evening about the blue crown hanging parrot that he'd seen. So bird watching really intrigues others. Sometimes it can be really sociable. Uh, here's a picture from last autumn, uh, October the 17th, 2020, uh, the global big birding weekend. Uh, this was a few hours after uh, uh, we'd found uh, a rufous tailed uh, scrub robin or rufous bush chat at Stifke in Norfolk. It was the first one that you could see in the UK since 1965. Normally in Southern Europe or Eastern Europe, uh, this was probably an Eastern race, so from Eastern Europe. Um, so it was the first one that anybody had been able to see. And within an hour or so, 100 people had arrived. By the end of the day, we estimate about 900 people had seen it, uh, broadly socially distancing most of the time. Um, and if you remember back to Chris Orgill's notebook, um, the bird on the left hand side was a, was the painting of the rufous tailed scrub robin uh, that we, we were all looking for in this. It was in this patch of suede in the middle here. So sometimes it can be really sociable and going back even further. This is 1989. Um, we found or we identified a red breasted nuthatch. So for all you North Americans on the call, uh, a common garden bird. But this was the only one that's ever occurred in the UK. Still the only one that's ever occurred in the UK. Um, on the day we found it, uh, about, about 400 people saw it. The next day, there were another 1,200 people there. Uh, October, it was found, and it stayed until May. So uh, lots and lots of people saw it. And in fact, I, I heard that there's been one in Iceland this week, so another European record. 
I think that would be about the fourth European record, but still the only European record. And, and twitching and bird watching in the UK is a very, very popular subject, really popular. Lots of bird watchers doing it. Uh, often you'll get kind of for rarities like this, you'll get big crowds uh, when we're allowed to travel again. And I think partly that's because the country is quite small, so you can do the whole of the breadth of uh, the UK. But also going back to migration, um, being on the edge of Europe uh, across the Atlantic from uh, from the US, we get often US birds, we get often birds from Siberia. So we get a real kind of collection of species that come and, and that migration aspect uh, and, and birds getting lost or blown off course. But also migration is, a, is a, another feature that makes bird watching really exciting. So, but, you know, we've talked a lot about that, but really it's about the birds and birds are just there to be enjoyed and some some birds are just fantastic so just going to uh, dwell on a, a few birds and just kind of share them uh, a violet tailed sylph a hummingbird that i'd always wanted to see uh, a fantastic looking tail actually when it displays it it, it spreads it into a, a, a long fork these are like two streamers but beautiful colors on a on a, a violet tailed sylph uh, a, a, a hummingbird that you find on the western slope of the andes in Ecuador and Colombia. The spectacle, the magical spectacle of an Arctic seabird colony. This is in uh, Varanga in Arctic Norway. And the noise, the smell, the, the, the kind of the constant hustle and bustle of the seabird colony. This is from the same seabird colony that you saw in the, in the uh, early slides. But the sheer number of birds on the sea, it was like an oil slick of birds. It was incredible. And every now and again, a white-tailed eagle would cruise through and try and catch one. Um, unfortunately for us, sometimes a jerk falcon will also cruise through. We, we weren't lucky to see a jerk falcon on the day we were there, but a fantastic spectacle. And, and just we sat there for hours just enjoying this whole kind of thing unfold in front of us. Some birds are just words just kind of fail you. Uh, Andean cock of the rock in, um, in Ecuador, just incredible colours, blood red. Um, it's got no bill because it's hidden under this massive crest. Uh, they gather in the early morning to uh, elect to, to try and attract females, making horrible noises, but then looking in, uh, fantastic in the early morning light as this kind of bright plumage becomes evident. Super, super birds. Some are a little bit more uh, subtle and uh, watching Stella's Eiders on the sea. Uh, funny how all the males congregate together, the females separate, uh, but one of the one of the finest looking sea ducks that you can find. Beautiful beautiful bird uh, that green patch on the back of their head uh, huge white patch on their wings and uh, and just riding the waves as the as the waves kind of came in on the on the swell fantastic to watch Stella's Eiders iconic bird of the forests of Asia a rhinoceros hornbill um, this is an absolutely huge bird it's, a, it's about a meter from uh, bill tip to tip of tail uh, with a a similar wingspan or a slightly longer wingspan and it makes it as as it's flying you can hear the wings make a noise it's a huge bird but fantastic to see uh, and with this enormous uh, ridiculous cask on the top of its uh, on the top of its bill and top of its head fantastic bird to see really really superb and sometimes birds just you know th these are one of my favorite species um, we call it black-throated diver in europe the arctic loon in in, uh, in the us um, but, but the intricate patterns of the neck and the, and the, uh, the, the way that the black of the throat sort of shades into the gray on the back of the head, and then these stripes on the side of the neck and on the breast, and then that checkerboard pattern on the back. To, to even think that that's made from feathers just is, is mind blowing it. They are absolutely superb uh, looking things. So I really love uh, the divers and probably black throat is one of my favorite species. But it's not always about patterns and colours and plumages and stuff like that. Bird watches also like the really kind of skulky, dark brown, speckly things. And here is a Siberian thrush that I managed to see in Malaysia before lockdown just last year. For us in Britain, Siberian thrush is a mythical bird. It's, it's very, very rare, um, only occurs a few times. Uh, we all dream of finding one in the UK, uh, only occasionally uh, they are found. Uh, so to just find this hopping up into a tree, you know, it's it's a birder's bird. It's it's skulky, it's brown, it's got a bit of rarity value. It's got a stripe above the eye, a supercilium. It's got some crescentic markings underneath. 
it, it ticks all my boxes. It really got my heart uh, and my pulse racing. So a fantastic bird to see. The next day we had a male walking around on the ground, which was even more amazing. Uh, but I didn't get a photograph of that. I did what I said earlier on. I watched it. I got I got a really good views of it rather than worrying about getting my camera out. So Siberian thrush. But sometimes it's not about the birds. Sometimes you see things that just take your breath away. And um, that happened for us uh, on a family holiday, actually, uh, when we were out in the Pantanal in Brazil and a jaguar uh, decided to pay us a visit on the edge of a river. We were on a canoe and uh, we got some incredible views of jaguar in the Pantanal. And that was one of those moments that you will never, ever forget. My whole family will never forget this moment, just watching this amazing animal uh, walking up and down the river bank. It was it was fantastic. Now, people often ask me, what's, what's my favourite bird? Every bird watcher is going to get this question in their life. And I think it's an almost impossible question to answer. Um, but I always come back to one species, which is probably a little bit surprising for some people, but um, it's a Ross's gull. Um, and it, in 1984, uh, so a long, long while ago now, there was an adult summer plumage Ross's gull in Norfolk, where I live. Um, it was a Kyan Titchwell. Um, and it was a full adult in summer plumage. So it was, it had the black collar. It had a lovely pink belly and chest. And this is a really poor drawing from my old notebooks. Um, uh, but it's just one bird that every time ask me, uh, people ask me, what's my favorite one? I think it surprises some people that I would say a gull, but I think anybody that's seen an adult summer plumage Ross's gull will understand why I think that's one of the best things I've ever seen. So um, that's probably my favorite one. But birds are just great. So that's what I would say to you is just, just look at them. Even the commonest birds, when you really look at them, when you really get a good look and you study them, are amazing. Here's a common starling. And look at the, the patterns, the, the spots, the edges of the feathers. Um, they're just fantastic. The structure, the colours, the way that the feathers all fit together. Birds are just cool. So um, I would just say to you, birds are great. Just, just enjoy them. Uh, Get your bins get out there and have a look and um hopefully uh that's encouraged you to either get out birding locally if you've not done it before or go out again uh many thanks for the team uh, and we hope hope it's encouraged you to perhaps pick up the internet after this and look for a rock jumper tour and we'll see you on one uh, hopefully very soon oh, so thank you very much and thanks to the team for the photographs that they shared with me oh thank you the photos were Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, before we go into Q&A with Keith and Paul, um, just to let you know, the webinars in the series are being offered free of charge, should you, however, wish to donate, donate towards our tour leaders. Our GoFundMe donation link is still open and uh, in your chat. And... Um, just also a quick reminder that on the 17th of February, Greg de Klerk will take us on a virtual safari of South Africa's highlight birding locations and showstopper species such as the pink-throated twin spot, Drakensberg rock jumper, yay, and blue <laughs> crane and ground woodpecker. Um, join him for a memorable overview of his home country. Um, over to you guys. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Nikki. Thanks. Thanks again, Paul. No uh, wonderful. We've got some, some awesome messages coming through. Thanks to everyone for joining. Um, <laughs> Judith just said, love, love that British humour. Uh, my favourite <laughs> moment of the talk, the beluga. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. That got so much Twitter activity, that picture of the beluga. People were kind of talking about how he, um, how he got such detail. And was it, was it, yeah, are you sure you didn't have photographs and draw it from that? It was, it was one of my, Favorite moments of the year that was. Oh, it was, it was fantastic. We got we got some comments here in the, in the chat side as well from people who, who picked up on that. Uh, you, you'd mentioned before about you know four things, and I think enthusiasm was definitely one of them. You know when it goes to birding, but a healthy sense of humor certainly helps as yeah, well. Uh, that was that was expertly delivered there, Paul. Um, but yeah, folks are saying wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, fantastic presentation. Thanks. So yeah. Fantastic, Paul. Uh, we don't have we don't have too many uh, as far as the the Q and A goes, but uh, we'll go right ahead and, and dive in. There's a few questions around um, around binoculars yeah. uh, that come through, and, and I guess that makes sense given uh, given that they are 
pretty much a, a primary item when it comes to, to birding. Um, and I know you did, you did touch on it, obviously, in the beginning. Yeah, sure. In our itself. But uh, Pamela's just asking here and says, uh, any thoughts on the perfect binoculars for beginners? Uh, she's heard about eight times being best for forest birding, mm. uh, likes the idea of high magnification, although concerned about weight. Uh, yeah. We'd just like to hear your thoughts. So maybe I think that's, just touch. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really, it, it's a really personal choice. And I, I think any bird watch would say the same. Um, it's, um, you definitely don't want to go too high in magnification. The, the higher you go in magnification, the harder it is to hold binoculars still. That's why when you've got a telescope, you need a tripod because the magnification is high. You get fantastic views, but you need stability. So if you're holding binoculars, you, you know, the magnification is, is, a, is a really key thing. I, I, as a personal choice, I've always had eight times binoculars. Mm. Um, uh, other birders have 10 times. And I think that part of the reason for that is historically eight times had a wider field of view. So it was easier to find things. But I think nowadays, the modern binoculars, some of the 10 times binoculars have got fantastic fields of view. So when you look, although you've got magnification, you can also see widely as well. Mm. So when you're trying to scan and find things, what you've got to think about is the higher the magnification, generally speaking, the harder it is to find something that you're looking for. If it's in a tree, you, you kind of, you know, the, the more you practice, the easier this gets as well. But if it's a high magnification, you, you, it's harder to find things. So, so I would, if you're definitely doing lots of forest birding, my personal preference is I'd go for eight times um but it's absolutely a personal thing and um and if you give someone advice on what type of binocular to see as i said to you guys earlier on that i absolutely knew without any shadow of doubt i was going to buy swarovski binoculars when i went to the shop to buy some and i came out of a pair of zeiss um now they're both absolutely superb binoculars and okay they're they're top end binoculars but it's the same in every every price category. It will be about how they feel to you, and little things like how do you find the focus mechanism? Where is where is the focus wheel for your hands um, and your fingers? So so there is really no. There are loads of good binoculars. The best thing I could do is say to you is is, is actually go somewhere where you can actually try them. And a lot of places now have places where you can try them where there's either targets or there's even feeders and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, I know that's really tricky at the moment because we can't go anywhere, uh, a lot of us, but, um, if you can wait until you can go somewhere and try different types, I would really encourage you to do so. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. there are just different, I mean, you can, you can spend anything. I mean, I'm talking in pounds. You can spend anywhere between a hundred pound and 2,500 pound or 3,000 pound on binoculars these days. The range is huge. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but it's really difficult to pin it down to any particular type of binoculars. Um, yeah, you know, no, I think it's great. You'll love your binoculars once you get them. That's the key thing. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you, I mean, if you're a bird too, would, would you have any different perspective on that? Well, I was going to, I was going to say, I was just going to chip in there and say, um, you know, I mean, I grew, I grew up birding with a, with a pair of very lightweight, uh, seven by 35 pen taxes and, mm. uh, and, and birded, I started birding when I was, when I was really young. Um, you know, sort of six, seven years old. And, you know, these were very lightweight and they were easy yeah. to use and they were small. And, you know, um, but I'll never forget when I looked through my first pair of 10 miles and I was just blown away. Yeah. It was, wow, just look at these. And they were, they were a good pair. I mean, they were a pair of Likers. And yeah. I was just, that was that was it. And I've, I've never had anything else besides 10s. Yeah. Uh, I guess just because that was, that was what I then got yeah. from these sevens and was just blown away by the increased magnification. <laughs> exactly. and all of these, you know, you used to be like, Oh, well, yes, that is the, yeah, that's, that's the violet and the violet at wax ball, you know, sort of thing at, yeah. at a few hundred meters. And then with these 10 bars, you, you know, it's right yeah, in your yeah, face. It's right there. Yeah. yeah. So, so no. for me, it's always, it's always been that way. Um, yeah. But it is what you're exposed to and it is, it is certainly what you. Um, and it's a personal choice. It's also about yeah. um, how heavy they feel in the hand and stuff exactly. like that. Exactly. Um, exactly. My wife's got a small pair and I keep saying to her, do you want to, do you want to, a nicer pair and she goes no i really i really like these because they're nice and small so it's yeah. just about comfort and as i said it's not about 
it's not necessarily always about quality it's just how they feel for you so that's why i would say if you, if you can try them, that's the right yeah. thing to do yeah you're going to be comfortable with them without a doubt yeah. a couple of folks here as well asking just about uh, binoculars for kids um yeah and and the same thing the same thing applies i would say um the the the, the similar principles apply you know there are there is a range uh, a, a range of kind of quality uh, from sort of low end to to, to really high end uh, the really high end binoculars basically are the, the reason they're so good is that they're so good at gathering light so so that where they really really excel is in, mm -hmm. in low light conditions are either at dusk and dawn or in deep forest so for most people that's not going to be completely necessary um, and I would say more for children I would say then it's about comfort and heavy and weight yeah. uh, probably the, like you know back to your Pentax seven buys seven times what what you really want uh, kids to do is is to become comfortable with holding them and, and not too heavy so you know you want them to get the experience of seeing stuff so you want them to be able number one you want them to be able to see through them and kind of focus them easily but they also need to not be too heavy so they can actually really uh, really absorb what they're seeing and get hooked you want them to be interested so um again i would i would, I would try and get them to to try and look for a range of, uh, of different pairs but but i would probably focus more on the weight side then in terms of uh, in ter instead of necessarily real kind of top optical quality it's about being comfortable particularly then yeah agree 100 percent absolutely 100 percent with that um great so jeff's also asking here just how important is lens lens size in bins well again this 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 comes back to uh, so so you, you you'll see now um uh, you'll get binoculars that are 842 832 uh 10 1050 1042 so the, the the first number is the magnification and the second number is the size of the lens at the other end the objective lens so the, the size of that lens kind of tends to um signify how much light gathering they've got uh, and and generally speaking the bigger the lens at the far end uh the uh the more light gathering qualities they've got but of course there's a trade-off mm. the trade-off is they're probably heavier so um so your, your challenge then is if you go for um you know 10 by 50 people don't tend to have 10 by 50 but when i was growing up 10 by 50 were all the rage my old mm. genoptim zeiss were 10 50s big huge things um now the new range of binoculars especially these kind of roof prism binoculars the the, the straight ones that you see the, the the sort of straight through um they're they're just so much better at gathering light anyway that um that whether it's 10 by 42 or 8 by 42 or 8 by 32 is, is less relevant i think it's and it and it's really only relevant as i said to you just now which is when you're in either dusk or dawn or in deep forest most of the rest of the time um the objective lens you know that range between 30 and 50 is is probably going to be okay it's, it's it's really then about the quality of the optics and the coatings that are on the actual lenses that are going to be more important than the size of the lenses so um i think it's a trade-off between weight um functionality and kind of an an, an image that you get through them and again okay. As I said, it's, it's it's still quite a personal choice. As I'm being deliberately I'm I'm being vague there because I don't really have an answer that that's other than try a whole load of them and see which ones are the best for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because it is, as you said from the beginning, it's a very personal thing, without a doubt. Um, just another comment, just quickly. Uh, Abdul's asking uh, comment on monoculars. Have any any thoughts? Yeah. On they're, they're, they can be they can be nice and easy to use um i mean it, effectively all the spotting scopes we use are are just a big monocular on a on a, on a tripod sure. um you know they're uh if if, it, if it's if it suits you uh they they can be easy to see again i i don't know much of it i've got a monocular that i used for um uh, for particularly for kind of small insects when I was looking for dragonflies and, and butterflies that I, I bought a while ago. The new binoculars are so good at close focus nowadays as well. <laughs> that's the other thing that's changed that you I don't need that anymore. So I don't use it hardly, but, but uh, that was really helpful for kind of um, for doing especially close up stuff. Uh, but I've not, I've not used a monocular for birding um, 
ever really but if, if it means that it's if it's in your pocket and it means that you means you've got some optics that you can use because it's there fantastic because you know if you see something you see it now and you've got something you can look at it with a closer view brilliant so um uh, but equally if if you've got one that you like and it's and it's good for you then wh why not why not mm, yeah absolutely uh, Sandra's asking here, just about a clothing question. What material for slacks do you recommend for forest birding? Oh, that's a really good question. Again, <laughs> again, um, I, 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 I mean, we have a brand in the UK called uh, Rohan that I just find so comfortable. Uh, but there are whole, there are, there are, you know, there are countless brands around of these, of these, um, uh, of these type of, uh, uh, you know companies that are around and they all have their different variation of them they're all wicking uh, they're all kind of um uh they're all kind of comfortable they're perhaps elasticized some of them are kind of impregnated with insecticide to stop insects biting you um i think again um it depends on where you are in the country in in, in the uk we have several brands you know rohan's one of the big ones but there are others as well but in the us it might be a whole different range of companies and the same in uh, in the rest of europe um the, the thing for me is always about comfort um be as comfortable as you can especially if you're going into a um, warm tropical forest you know the one thing you want to be is comfortable having said that if you're going to really asian forests uh, and looking for kind of birds in sort of malaysia or indonesia and then you've got to wear your leech socks comfort tends to go out the window a little bit but but it's that or be bitten by leeches sometimes so i'm probably kind of putting people off a bit i was terrified of leeches the first time i went over there i got bitten by two leeches and actually didn't know until i'd got home and uh, and took my clothes off and then found that i'd been bitten so <laughs> i didn't even notice that i'd been bitten by leeches but um yeah comfort is the key thing something that's comfortable something that's wicking that allows you to breathe um quick drying and also um you know doesn't rustle too much doesn't make too much. I think noise. that's yeah, absolutely key for forest birding as well. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing it's too noisy or that sort of rustly yeah. fat. Yeah, 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 definitely not. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's it. Hey? Lightweight, quick drying. They're all they're all helpful. Yeah. But there's a lot of as, as and there's as, a whole as, range as, of different brands, materials right? that people do now. They've all got their own version of a kind of a of that material that are made from different fibers and what have you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of sort of outdoor clothing stores and what have you have a lot. Yeah, well, all of them. Yeah, to choose from yeah um and i guess yeah it's all it's all this there's more and more on the market eh, than there was sort of 10 10 15 20 yeah. years ago i mean this is a this is a, this is a growing kind of um clientele eff effectively the people that are interested in uh visiting good places uh, interesting sort of out of the way places seeing wildlife doing these type of tours is a is kind of a new kind of market for a lot of these companies and they're mm. and they're actually um, same with optics that the, the technology is increasing at leaps and bounds and, and, and the stuff that they're producing is becoming more and more pleasant to wear. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, just, just a couple more questions there quickly. Sure. Um, Ben's is asking, he's, uh, he's got an area that he's frequently walks around near his house and uh, he started to get quite familiar with the local birds in that zone. Uh, he says, doesn't have any sort of friends or, or know people that are birders. Um, but what what should, what would what would you advise as his next step to go out and get to see more birds and, and right. try and okay. yeah this is, get this stuck is into i mean this this it, this would be easier in normal circumstances than it is now of course sure. and you can travel but um what i would say to him is um the first thing i'd su suggest is if there is a local club or a local society mm -hmm. uh of bird watchers th that would be a fantastic place to start when when i was I said to you guys, I started when I was nine. When I was 12, my mum and dad moved to Norfolk, which is a great county for bird watching. But the real catalyst for me was joining a local bird club. And in this local bird club, there were, there were birders, like what I call proper, really interested, uh, enthusiastic birders. And they just, they just changed my interest to, to a kind of a new level in terms of, of really kind of creating that enthusiasm. And also would be prepared to take me out and show me stuff and i learned loads by going birding with these other guys so a bird club uh, locally would be a fantastic place if that's if that's not possible and you can travel a little bit further afield uh, as we said in the talk the great thing about birds is that 
if you, once you kind of understand what, what you get around you locally, then if you just move not too far away necessarily, but to a different habitat, if there's a, if there's a lake or a woodland uh, and you've been looking at garden and parkland, um, go, go and try that uh, and try a different habitat. Uh, if, you can, um, if you can travel a bit further afield and even stay for a few days in a different locality, then, then try that. Um, but of course, if you if you're really really stuck and you want to do something uh, really interesting, you can always look and see if there's a tour that's going somewhere that you want to go. Um, <laughs> but but I mean, joking aside, uh, what you also might find is that you might find that there are other bird watchers on that tour that, that live near with you and near you, or, or even know of places nearby that you could visit. Um, the other thing it's worth doing is. Uh, there is a resource, and I don't know if everybody uses it. Uh, have you have you come across Fatbirder, uh, Keith? There's a, yeah, there's, so there's a resource on the internet called Fatbirder, and Fatbirder basically has a whole load of information about different locations around the planet. So if you if you go into Fatbirder, you can do a, there's a map of the world. You can click on a map uh, for the US. You can click on states. Now what that also does is you can dig into places, and it gives you it gives you site guides for some places in, in a state or in a country. It also gives you reports that people have seen around there, but it also adds this thing about local birders. And I've done this, I've, I've actually hooked up with a local birder. Uh, if I was going to Brazil, for example, for, for a work trip for agriculture, then um, I've met a local birder through Fat Birder and they've taken me out birding for a day. So uh, there are sort of local forums and, and, and things like that. I think there's a, find a local bird thing on, on fat birder that you can do that and if if, if you don't go out with them because it's you know, a bit too too scary they still might be able to provide some information about where to go and, and what to see so um, I would try that as well absolutely great thanks Paul um, and then final question here before we wrap things up um, James is asking she's uh, always received rock jumpers brochures and uh, she's looked at all the tours on the website, but she's never actually gone on an international trip before. Um, and saying mostly it's just, it's really due to feeling, this, this feeling that she's almost not qualified enough for like the, these uh, professional rock yeah. jumper type tours. She's so asking basically, do the tours cater for people who are not pro birders? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think, um, uh, I mean, you, again, you, Keith, you're much more experienced than I am, but uh, my experience is that, you, know, you have a range of people on the tours um, from from really skillful, experienced people that, that want to see specific birds potentially to uh, people that just are happy to be out in a really fantastic place and be shown stuff. Um, and as, as Nikki said right at the beginning, the great thing is that the people that you get on these trips are fantastic people. They're normally really nice people. Um, you've all got a common interest. They're really helpful with each other. I mean, you know, if you're the guide on a trip, the great thing about being a guide on a trip is you have another 12 guides or six guides with you that are helping your 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 clients see stuff that everybody wants everybody to see everything um so absolutely don't be scared to try a, a trip it's a brilliant way of um uh, it's a really brilliant way of seeing stuff if you know if you go somewhere that you've not been before going with a guide you'll definitely see far more things than if you go on your own. It's, it's, you know, unless you're doing loads of homework and loads of research, guides can really help you see lots of birds and just make it easy for you. And yeah, don't worry about your skill level. Uh, the, the, these tours cater for every kind of level of, uh, of bird watcher and, and you'll see some stuff that will, will blow your mind. You'll see amazing things and visit amazing places. So I'd really encourage you to go for it. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Thanks, Paul. Cool. Really appreciate your comments. Um, yeah, thank you to everybody for joining us. It's uh, it's been another wonderful webinar, and yeah, hope you got uh, got something out of the uh, the taking a look at uh, beginner birding and and how to get into birding. And I think, as Paul said as well, for all of us who are experienced, if you took out a little little tip or a little experience or a, a memory out of that as well, so um yeah it was it was wonderful thank you so much thank you very much thank you thank you all right goodbye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.